Welcome to New Life Living, brought to you by New Life Church in Rio Rancho, New Mexico. Is there an afterlife? Are heaven and hell just religious fantasies? This Bible teaching series, led by Pastor Alan Brooks, will reveal what we know, what we don't know, and what you need to know before you go beyond death's door. Good morning, New Life family. We're a church, right? So that means we can be honest with each other. How many of you thought you were actually showing up to the 9 o'clock service? No hands. Oh, one in the back, okay. (laughs) At the 9 o'clock service, it started to look like everybody was going to come to the 11 o'clock service at one point. But um, good morning. We're continuing in our series today, Beyond Death's Door. Got a line for you, see if you recognize It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Who knows what that's from? Tale of Two Cities, author, Charles Dickens. I thought about that phrase this week in light of what we're talking about today, because I think what we're going to talk about today for some will be the best of times. For others, it'll be the worst of times. What we're talking about today is the Bema Seat. The judgment day for believers. Now, some are even surprised to learn there is a judgment day for believers, but in fact, there is. As we've gone through this series, one of the things that I've sought to do is I've tried to kind of start from the beginning. What was the cause of death? What did that mean? Because death wasn't just physical as we typically think about it. What were the results of all of that before the cross? And then what happened because of the cross and changed everything. Not only for those who had died before the cross, but for those, even us, who have yet to die since the cross. We talked last, we gathered on our study a couple of weeks ago, we talked about our resurrected bodies. And we're going to touch on that again a little bit today with Paul in our chapter uh, 5 of 2 Corinthians. But more than that, what you're going to see is he touches on this other issue, the judgment seat of Christ. And one of the statements he makes in there is we're going to draw attention today. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. If you haven't done so already, I'd ask you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed... We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So, we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage. And we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we at home or away... We make it our aim to please him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, good or evil. Be of good courage. What a good direction, I think, for all of us as believers. Because as believers, we have something different. When it comes to the issue of death, death does not exist for us in the same way that it does for an unbeliever. Sadly, I think that we don't often see that. We don't often see in our culture that Christians see death in a different way than non-Christians do. Paul, in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13, he says, We want you to know, brothers and sisters, what will happen to the believers who have died. And notice this phrase that I have to draw your attention to. 
so that you will not grieve like people who have no hope. For those of us, and it's happened within our own midst here recently, those of us who have loved ones, who knew the Lord and went to be with Jesus, that is what? That is a celebration. Certainly we mourn their passing here, the loss of that person here, but our loss is their gain. It's heaven's gain. And that's what should look radically different to us as believers. You've heard me say before, I'm not going to allow any kind of, you know, significant mourning. I I want you to miss me at my funeral service, but just not a lot, okay? I want you to celebrate. I mentioned I'm probably going to have clowns, although that sounds weird. I'm going to have some balloons. I've even thought mariachis recently. That would be kind of cool, okay? Because when I die, I don't want you to grieve for me. You can grieve for yourself. Hopefully my wife might even grieve a little bit for me. But I'm going to be celebrating, Because I'm going to be with Jesus. And that's part of what Paul's trying to tell us in this passage. Is that we should see death in an entirely different life. Part of it is that we have something to look forward to. New bodies. I love the analogy that Paul draws here. He talks about these earthly bodies as what? Tents. Now, for those of you that may not know this, when Paul was in Corinth, he actually worked as a tent maker. So it's a very appropriate analogy for him to draw with them. But think with me for a second. What's the difference between a building and a tent? Tents are very temporary. Buildings hopefully have a greater level of permanence. In our society here in America, unless you're homeless, you almost always have some kind of a permanent dwelling, be that a trailer or a house on a slab. Very few people live in tents in our society. Partly because it offers more protection to be in a building. It also has greater what for us in a building? Comfort. Now, I don't know about you. How many of you like to go camping? Okay. Now, I'm I'm talking real camping here. I'm not talking pulling your RV out of the storage yard, loading up the satellite dish in your select comfort bed. Okay. That's not what I'm talking about when I say camping. I'm talking about the real kind with a tent where you're actually down on the ground. Now, I like to go backpacking, and uh, my wife doesn't care for camping. Part of those reasons are health reasons. But she, like most people, doesn't like to sleep on the ground. I cheat a little bit. I actually have a little pad that I put on the ground, you know, to keep me up off the ground. But Paul's point here is that when we go camping, when we are in a tent for a time, there's a part of us that groans. I mean, I've been out a few days camping, and you know what I want to do? I want to go home. I want to go to my house. I want to be where my wife is, snug and comfortable in my house. And that's part of what Paul's telling us, is we have this new body to look forward to. Not only that, we will be at home with the Lord. See, when I go home from camping, I'm with my wife, who I love a lot. But when we die, we get to go be with Jesus the one who created us, the one who made us, the one who died for us. And that's part of why a believer should be looking to celebrate. When I saw this passage this week, you know, I, I thought of God kind of as my divine or eternal contractor. And it made me think of something that Jesus had said to his disciples as he was gathering them together, I think around the Last Supper time. It's in our John chapter 14, verse 2. Jesus speaking, he says, there's more than enough room in my father's house. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? Now, I'd often thought about this as kind of, you know, my heavenly house on a hill or something. But maybe it has something to even do with how he's working on that new body that each one of us is going to get. And it made me think about that in a little bit different way this week. Paul also wants us to realize what Hebrews 13, 4, 14 says. He says, this world is not our permanent home. We're looking forward to a home yet to come. I fail in that sometimes. Maybe you do too. I get caught up in the stuff of this life, and I get really focused about what's going on here. And I forget, I'm just camping right now, okay? I'm on this extended camp trip right now. That my eternal home is yet to be realized in heaven. 
Now, sadly, very few of us think a lot about that eternal home. We think a lot more about this earthly tent and this place where we're currently camping. But to our point here for the study today, this verse again, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So we go into this, I want you to first realize there are different types of judgment and even different timing for when these judgments take place. The first judgment is what I would call the judgment of salvation. The judgment of salvation, for all practical purposes, takes place when you cross the threshold of death's door. See, at that point, you had to have already made a choice. Smoking or non-smoking? Heaven or hell? Before you cross the threshold. Jesus, speaking and recorded by John in our chapter 3, verse 18, says, There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, speaking of Jesus. But anyone who does not believe in him, help me, who's him? Jesus has already been judged. And it gives the reason here for not believing in God's one and only Son. I hear every once in a while, and I'm sure you do too, that Christians are narrow-minded. You know, how dare we say that only people who are Christians get to go to heaven? Get this, we, we didn't come up with that. This is from the mouths of Jesus himself. Now, if you've got an argument about the way he set things up, I suggest you take that up with him. But all we're simply doing is saying what he's told us. Now, when the unbeliever crosses the threshold of death's door, we know that he goes to this place called what? Hades. The same place that unbelievers have gone since the beginning. They will continue to wait until another event that we're going to talk about next Sunday, the great white throne judgment. We should have a great turnout, I'm sure, for that study next week, okay? Because we're going to talk about when people actually go to hell. Because technically nobody's in hell yet. They're just waiting to go to hell. And it's a long wait. Because even if you died as an unbeliever today, you've got to wait for the great tribulation to take place, seven years of tribulation on the earth, and then at the end of that, there's another thousand-year reign of Christ upon the earth before you will be brought out to actually stand before God at the great white throne judgment. Gives us a lot of time to think about it, doesn't it? Or at least those who are there. But in our passage today, Paul is addressing believers. He's talking to people in Corinth who already have put their faith and trust in God. And he's telling them that they too will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now this is important. Paul uses a different word for judgment here than he does in other places personally. He uses a different word for judgment here than even John did in that passage that I shared with you out of John. The word Paul uses here is the word bema or bema, depending on the way you want to pronounce that word. This is a very unique word relative to this particular judgment. Paul actually only uses it one other time in the book of Romans. In Corinth, in the first century, they were famous for the Ismithian games, because Corinth is an isthmus. And athletes would come from the world around and would compete there a lot like we have athletes come and compete in the Olympics. In the competitions, once they finished, they would go stand before this elaborate, ornate platform. I actually have a picture of one that they unearthed in Corinth. I don't think it actually said Bema originally. Somebody put that plaque on there. But this is the platform that the emperor would sit upon as he would give out the awards, as he would give out the crowns to the athletes for their accomplishment in those games. So realize that the Corinthians, when they read this, this Bema seat, that's immediately where they went to. That was immediately what they envisioned, is the emperor handing out these crowns. Now, there's some debate about when this actually occurs for believers. Some think maybe it happens when the believer crosses death's door. Others believe that it's actually at the resurrection, when we receive the resurrection of the bodies. That would seem to agree with what Paul believed. In writing young Timothy, 
Paul wrote this. He said, I fought the good fight. I finished the race and I've remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, notice when he says he'll get it, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize, he says, is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. So according to Paul, Paul saw that he was going to get this crown of righteousness, that he would stand before the Bema seat when he was resurrected from the grave. Now, I love the end of this verse because I've got to tell you that I look at people like Paul and I just kind of am ashamed a little bit, right? Because, I mean, this guy was awesome. I mean, when he turned himself over to Christ and stopped persecuting the Christians and became one of them, he sold out. He put the pedal to the metal and he went all in. Paul, Apostle Paul, wrote two-thirds of our New Testament. If it wasn't for him, our New Testament would be a pretty slim you know, collection of writings. But because of Paul, we know so much more. Because of Paul, many of us are here. Because Paul was willing to go out into the known world and preach this good news so that others would have the knowledge of salvation, many came to Christ. And so when I hear about Paul receiving a crown, I'm like, absolutely, totally deserving of that. But what is Paul telling us? It's not just for me. This is something that you should be going for yourself. The Bema seat to me is what I would call the judgment of service. In the message, our verse 10 today appears this way. It says, we will appear before Christ and take what's coming to us as a result of our actions, either good or bad. I've shared with you before that I like this show called Undercover Boss and how these executives go undercover, they you know, put on a disguise and they go work in their actual business alongside of people that work there. Well, when it's all done, they film this whole thing, every person they've actually filmed has to come and appear before the CEO of the company and stand accountable for what they've done. And for some, it's the best of times because they get rewarded. Very oftentimes, the CEO rewards them in amazing ways with what a good asset they've been to the company. Some of you that have seen the show realize that for some, it's also the worst of times because they get corrected or rebuked, even fired for how poor of a job they were doing for the company. Now, track with me to the Bema seat again. Instead of appearing before the CEO of our company, we're standing before the chief executive officer of the universe, who doesn't just have a one-day video of our life. He's got the whole thing. Everything I ever did, thought, or said. Jesus Speaking of this in Matthew said, I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. Wow, everyone? That's more than I can count on two hands just to say, okay? Every careless word that I spoke, I've got to give account for? Now, realize this. As believers, as those who have put our trust in Christ... Our sin has been paid for on the cross. That means we're not going to be punished for the bad things that we've done. But it does mean that we're going to stand accountable for how we lived our lives after we came to Christ and what we did with those lives. That's this judgment of service that we're talking about. I saw a cute story about a preacher and a bus driver who arrived in heaven together and an angel came by and said that he was in charge of housing. And so he took them first to the bus driver's house. And it was this beautiful mansion that was up on a nice grassy hill. And the bus driver's like, wow, cool, awesome. And the preacher's like really excited, thinking, man, that guy got a great place. Let me go see mine now, right? So when he turns the corner, he's down in some trees in this little shanty shack. 
And he's like, whoa, whoa, what's up? You know, I, I spent my life as a preacher. A bus driver got that great house over there on the hill. And the angel explained, well, when he drove people around, he made them pray and draw nearer to God. When you preached, people just fell asleep. Now, some of you need to wake up out there because you're messing with my house, okay? (laughs) But to the point, what is it exactly that we are going to be looked at here? What is it that God wants to know about what we've done with our lives? I think a good place for you to look more at this later is in Matthew chapter 25. And I'm just going to share with you briefly the parable of the talents there. But there's the story that Jesus gives of a master who goes away on a long trip. Before he goes, he takes everything that he has and he divides it among three servants. And he gives them talents. To one, he gives five talents. To another, he gives two talents. To the third, he gives a single talent. Now to explain a little bit, a talent in those days was a measure of weight. It's the equivalent of our pounds and to the number of about 75 of them. A talent in that culture was a lifetime of earnings. So that could be a million to two million dollars just for a single talent. The guy who got five got well over 10 million that he's supposed to take care of. As you look at this parable, as you should with all parables, you need to start to recognize what the heavenly meaning the earthly story is trying to convey. I believe the master who goes away on a long trip is who? It's Jesus. And I believe that time is the time from when he ascended to heaven to when he comes back for the church. The three servants, who are they? That's us. What are the talents, though? See, I don't believe the talents are a lifetime of wages. I think the talent is a lifetime. And I think what God wants to examine, what he's going to evaluate at the Bema seat, is how we used our life, what we did with it. And for some, that's going to be the best of times. For others... It's going to be the worst of times. I think one of the things that's going to be looked at is how long we waited before we truly decided to walk with Christ. I didn't grow up in church, so I can blame my parents for that. But when I turned about 17 years of age, I actually prayed a sinner's prayer, and I believe I started to put my faith and trust in Jesus. And so at that moment, I really started to live for Him. I wish. I spent the next 14 years just messing around. And for all practical purposes, all that Jesus was was a fire insurance policy. And I kept that premium paid up by showing up to church every once in a while and throwing a few bucks in the offering plate. And I even open up my Bible and say the Lord's Prayer for good measure, right? But that's really all that he was. Because I was consumed with things here. I wasn't worried about things future. I wasn't worried about standing before him. I don't even know that I knew that I would someday. I thought as long as I said the prayer, I'm in. We're all good, right? You know, I've actually heard Christians say, well, as long as I'm there, that's all that matters. I'm willing to bet you will not have that same kind of attitude standing in front of the Bema seat. Some of us, and I may be among you, will be embarrassed about how we've used our lives, how much time we've wasted, how much time we've spent on personal pursuits of pleasure, and how little time we've spent doing the things of the kingdom of God. And I don't know about you, but I'm concerned about that. I think we should be. I think in addition, what God's going to do is he's going to do an accounting of all that's come into our possession financially, all of our treasure Now, do the math on that just for a second, because most of us don't realize, but we're all millionaires. I mean, if all you make is 20 grand a year, most of us work 50 years or so, that's over a million dollars right there. And if you make more than that, then you make more than that. 
I used to live in Farmington, New Mexico, and there were a lot of uh, Mormons up in that community, and I remember talking with them that annually they had to go to their elder, to their bishop, and they had to take a copy of their tax return along with their tithe statement so that the elder could confirm that they had actually given 10% of their earnings to the church. Now, don't worry, we're not going to start doing that here, okay? But we shouldn't be concerned about what another man thinks. We should be concerned about what our Lord thinks. How is God going to look at that accounting? How is he going to speak to me about the stuff that's come into my control and how I've handled that? Has it all been just for me? Or am I investing in what he's doing? We're also going to be evaluated, I believe, on why we gave our time. Why we gave of our talents. Why we gave of our treasure. Because some of us did it for the wrong reasons. We did it to earn earthly credit. We did it so that the church might put a plaque on the wall that says, given by. We did it so we might earn some brownie points with God. Look like a better Christian among the rest of our Christian friends. All of that stuff, according to the Bible, will burn. Paul, in his earlier letter to the Corinthians, our chapter 3, verse 13, says, On judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, the builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. I've got to tell you that I not only want to give more of myself, of my time and my talents and my treasure, but I want to do it for the right reason. Let me tell you what the right reason is. Because you love and appreciate what Jesus did. If you're doing it for any other reason, then don't do it. If you leave today convicted that you're not giving your best to God, change that because of what he did, not because of what Pastor Allen said today. Because I want you to get credit for it. I want you to be rewarded for those good things that you've done. When you stand before Jesus, I don't want you to be embarrassed. In the parable of the talents, when the master comes back, he brings the servants together for an accounting, which is, I believe, this Bema seat. The first two have taken what God has given them, and they've doubled it. The guy who had five, he got it to ten. The guy who had two got it up to four. And what does the master tell them? Verse 21 of Matthew says, He was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. But then there's the third guy. For those of you that don't know his story, when he got his talent, apparently he just dug a hole and buried it in the ground, did nothing with it. When the master wants to know, hey, what's up? He starts to make excuses. Well, I knew you were a harsh man. I knew that you tried to reap where you did not sow. And the master says, you should have at least put it in the bank to earn some interest on it for me then. And then he says these words, words I hope that nobody in this room will ever hear. You wicked and lazy servant. Sadly, I believe there will be people standing before the Bema seat, people who have put their faith and trust in Christ, who will hear those very words from their Lord and Savior. Now, I'm not sure how that would make you feel, but I can tell you how that would make me feel. To think that the one who gave me his all so that I could have eternal life sits there and has to condemn me for how selfishly I lived my own life. And you know what? I'm without excuse because I preach it. By the way, you're without excuse too. 
you want to stand before Jesus, well, golly, I, I never knew that. You know, they, and he's going to just replay a little tape of Pastor Allen's message today. He won't show you much because it's not that good, okay? But he's going to show you that little part right there where Pastor Allen said, please, please, pay attention today. Some of you are too flippant with this. Some of you are not taking this seriously enough. And you're too focused on the things of this earth and not focused enough on the things of God. God gets it. Don't misunderstand me. He knows you have a job. He knows you have kids. He knows that you need things to take care of that family. But what he wants to know, is it all for you? Or is some of it his? In fact, see, that's part of our problem, I think. See, we think all of it's ours. All of our time, all of our talents, that's me. I'm a self-made man. But when we realize that that's him, that's his, and then all of a sudden I'm encouraged to give back some of that, then I will. I remember when I first started hearing about tithing, and for those of you that don't know what that means, it's giving 10% of your income to the Lord's work. I wasn't, again, raised in a church, so the idea of giving more than a dollar or five dollars was beyond my comprehension. Because, you know, quite frankly, I didn't have the money. And so I thought, you know, what I could do is I could tithe my time. And I figured, yeah, I got 168 hours in the week. I could certainly easily take part of that time and put it towards the church. And so my wife and I signed up to do, of all ministries, kids ministry. Which, by the way, I would suggest has great rewards in it. But for us, initially, that was how we were tithing. We were tithing with our time. But as time went by, God said, no, we're not done yet. I want you to start giving of your treasure. I'll tell you what, you test God in this. Scripture encourages us to test God in this. God will take care of you. You will never do without. You might not have everything you want, but you will always have everything that you need. God blesses us when we're obedient to the things that he calls us to do. Not only now, but he blesses us then too. And could I add that that's more important than now? Now is going to last you 70, 80, 90, 100 years maybe, right? But the blessing and the rewards that you will receive at the Bema seat, tell me again, how long does that last you? Forever, eternally. That's where we want to get it right. Today I want you to think about what's he going to say to you Is it going to be the best of times for you? Is he going to come and say, well done, my good and faithful servant? Or is it going to be the worst of times? Could it be, as scary as that might sound, that God would tell you that you've been wicked and lazy as his servant? Can I tell you that I think the time for us to get this right is now? Let's not wait until we're standing there and pretend like we didn't know, start making excuses like the third servant does. Let's get our act together now. When I played high school football, one of the things that I would do is I would train during the summer so that when it came to preseason training, guess what? I was ready to go. It was amazing, though, how many of the other athletes didn't do that. And so when it came to two days and the other practices, they weren't ready for it. And unfortunately, you know what that led to for some of them? They got cut. They didn't even make the team. Because they weren't being prepared for what they were supposed to be prepared for. Paul's point in verse 9 today, I think, is a point that you want to take home. Whether we're at home, here, on earth, or away, we make it our aim to please him. That's got to be the motivation. In his first letter to the Corinthians, our chapter 9, verse 24 says, You've all been to the stadium. You've seen the athletes race. Everyone runs. One wins. But what's he tell them to do? Run to win. All good athletes train hard. They do it for a gold medal that tarnishes and fades. You're after one that's gold eternally. Remember, this is Paul. He says, I don't know about you, 
But I'm running hard for the finish line. I'm giving it everything I've got. No sloppy living for me. I'm staying alert and in top condition. I'm not going to get caught napping, telling everyone else about it, and then missing out myself. The great truth that I see with Paul is that heaven wasn't just a destination for him. Heaven was his motivation. Most of us in this room see heaven as our destination. That's a good thing. But do you see heaven as your motivation? As the way that you want to be living your life now? The way that you want to invest back for the kingdom what God has given you in a way that will bring you eternal rewards? Because that's what the judgment of service is all about. Amen? Do you stand and let's pray? Father, as I shared earlier with the earlier group, I've, I've been very convicted by that passage just this week again, Lord, and, and recognizing I'm still not giving you my best. I think at times I, I stretch and I feel like I am for a time, but Lord, very easily I get my eyes back on this earth and the things of this earth and lose sight of you and what's really important Father, if any of my brothers and sisters are struggling with that today, I pray that that this message is something that moves deeply inside of them, that your Holy Spirit would speak to each and every one of our hearts and help us to realize what things are really about, and that for us, heaven wouldn't just simply be a destination, it would truly be our motivation. Father, I want us, I want me to start planning now, preparing now for what you have for me. And I want to, with all my brothers and sisters who are hearing this, to stand before that seat, that judgment seat. And I want to hear, Father, well done, good and faithful servant. I want that for my brothers and sisters too. I pray, Father, that you would move within us so that we're moved to do that for you, Lord. To get ourselves ready, to discipline ourselves, to train ourselves up, as Paul says in this passage. Father, for others, Lord, that aren't even at that place yet, that are hearing this message and going, wow, I'm not even sure about the whole Jesus thing yet. I pray that today they would recognize that you came to give life and to replace death. And it's my hope and prayer, Lord, that some who might hear this message today would decide they want to put their faith and trust in your son, that they want to believe that Jesus died for them, and that they would avoid the judgment of salvation because they believe in the name of Jesus. Father, thank you. Jesus, thank you for dying for us. Thank you for loving us enough. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for listening in. If you have any questions about New Life Living, you can call us at area code 505-898-9788 or email us at info at nlnm.org. Until next time, our prayer and hope is you will experience the fullness of the new life Jesus has to offer you.